Uh, well, tonight is the last night of a seven-month, 123-show tour. Um, we left in April, uh, and we're playing in Nuremberg here, and it's the last the last show of the tour, and it went went great. I mean, we, we did a lot of shows and saw a lot of new places, and it went really well. Um, I mean, it's a large group of people. We have, like, 22 people traveling right now. So we have, you know, the bus drivers, our crew, the support act, who's Michelle Willis right now, and the whole band, 10 people on stage. So there's quite a lot of people and a lot of personalities, but um, this band has been touring for 13 years, so I think everybody now understands how to exist in this kind of very strange environment where you don't have any privacy and you're just constantly around each other and next to each other all day. I think now we kind of have a, a method for doing it. So it's, it's very rare that there are problems actually. No, I definitely never expected the band to have the amount of success that it's having. I mean, it was just an outlet for music I was writing and an opportunity to have fun and try to do something unique with my friends. And uh, I didn't plan on this, um, but, you know, I worked towards it. And everyone in the band worked very hard towards it. And they all made a lot of compromises and a lot of sacrifices and, um, and gave a lot to build this thing up to what it has become. And, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like you find your audience. I also feel like you kind of create your audience in a way. I mean, if I make music thinking, okay, well, people just go to Spotify and if they don't like it in 10 seconds, then they're going to move. So I have to make something that's good in the first 10 seconds. I'm not going to make the music that I want to make, you know? So immediately those people who want something exciting right away, they're going to hear Snarky Puppy and say, I don't want this. And that's fine with me. Because <laughs> that's not the kind of people that I want at my concerts anyway. I want people that have an, a longer attention span and have an open mind, you know. And that's what I say is why I say, you know, the decisions that you make as a band ultimately kind of determine who's in your audience. So I would rather just do what we want to do. And if people like it, fantastic. And if they don't, that's, that's fine. I don't know that I feel comfortable with people looking at me like a role model, but yeah, I mean, it happened, you know, it happened the way that it happened and there's a lot of factors. It's not, it's definitely not just me, you know, it's, there's a lot that went into it from a lot of different people and a lot of good luck, a lot of sure. lucky decisions that we made, you know. but we work hard for sure. The first bass I ever played was a Squire jazz bass that was property of my high school when I was like 17. And then I bought a Warwick fretless thumb bolt-on maybe, I don't remember. Um, and that was kind of where I really started to get into the bass, I was playing fretless bass. Um, and then just before I went to college, I got a... Um, or maybe it was actually after I went to college. I got a Ken Smith four string, <laughs> which is like, you never see a four string Ken Smith, but I had one. And, um, and then I switched to P basses after using Tim LaFave's uh, vintage P bass on a gig in Dallas. Snarky Puppy was opening for Rudder, a band that he played with, and uh, my battery died in my Ken Smith, so I had to borrow his bass because I didn't have the battery. And um, and then I just fell in love with it. I found that when I was playing, I was like, I could, the action was really high, flat wounds. I couldn't play most of the stuff that I normally played, so I was playing like one fifth of the notes as normal. And everybody in the band was like, you sounded really good tonight. <laughs> And I was like, oh, it's because I'm not playing all the normal crap that I play, you know? And the bass limited me and changed the way that I played, and I liked that. And I liked that sound. To me, that's the sound of bass. So since then, that's been my 
thing, but I play lots of different basses. I have some great basses from, you know, Federa and, and F bass and Oliva Capolo and, uh, and a great, you know, Czech company and Nick Huber is letting me play a bass from, from, uh, Berlin, uh, from near Frankfurt. So, I mean, I have an old Hoffner, one of my favorite basses from 65. I have a lot of different stuff. Ukulele basses. I like them all. But, like, day after day after day, yeah, for sure. Vintage Fender P bass is my, my favorite. The bass I'm playing tonight is from 1959. It's all original. Yeah, it's a maple. It's awesome. I love it. I love it. Uh, and then I also have a 1952 P bass um, that I got for cheap because the guy who had it before me ripped out the pickup and put in like a an 80s EMG, which was not the smartest decision, I think. Yeah. And um, so I was able to get the bass very cheap and he had stripped the finish. and So I put a different pickup in it and um, and then I have a 65 Fender P bass. I have a 76 Fender P bass. It's a four piece. Although this 52 looks like a Telecaster bass. Um, and then I have um, a new Fender Jazz. I have, oh my God, I have, I have a lot of basses. But, but the, the uh, P basses, I have four. Yeah. Well, the Casa is like a, um, it sounds like an old school tube amp, but it's actually solid state, which is awesome because it, uh, it's very light. <laughs> um, but what we were going after with Marco and all the people at Mark Bass was trying to create an amp that sounds very old school, very um, kind of like 60s, 70s rock and funk and Motown kind of thing. but with the ability to handle the kind of high maintenance modern sounds like octave pedals and mini moog sub bass and key bass and all this kind of stuff um and i think the cause is really perfect for this it's i mean aside from like you know a vintage svt it's the my favorite bass amp i've ever played you know i mean in a recording studio i really love an ampeg b15 um but I've actually used the Casa in the studio several times when I wasn't getting the sound that I wanted out of the out of the B15, and it was awesome. So it's great. I mean, it's just like everything Mark Bass makes. It's very very light. Um, but I like that it doesn't have the kind of like normal like hi-fi Mark Bass sound. It has this kind of very old school sound that I I really dig. It's great. And and we also tried to be conscious of like also with the way that it looks, making a more like old school, you know, kind of design rather than like the bright yellow we went with like gold and kind of just making a more classic look because that's how I am as a bass player and a musician. I like old things, very fundamental and kind of simple. And, and I, f I find the Casa is really great for that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, um, Daryl Anders, who runs the bass department at MXR, has been very, very cool um, over the years with us in terms of like having us try out new things and asking us for feedback on that kind of Jim Dunlop MXR line of pedals. Uh, and actually, I, I play Jim Dunlop flatwound strings now. I switched several years ago and I still have the first pair, maybe three years ago or something, and I still have my original pair of strings on the bass. I'm, I, I leave them on for years. Um, so we just kind of worked together on this um, vintage bass octave pedal. It's like a mini um, MXR pedal, which I love. My, my kind of go-to octave pedal has always been the MXR uh, bass octave deluxe in terms of like an all-purpose, take one octave pedal on your gig pedal. This one has always been my favorite, but I also really love the Boss OC2, OC3 sound, this different wave 
you know, kind of waveform. And, and, um, and so I think MXR was trying to create a version of that, but smaller with some different features. And, uh, and I thought they did a great job. And for me, actually, I really like having both in my pedal board because they'd sound different to me. And the vintage bass octave also has like a mid boost. So there's some other, you have some other choices there and it's tiny, it's awesome, you know. They're doing great stuff over there. Um, my pedal board for this tour, every gig, all 123 gigs was, um, I have a Polytune tuner by TC Electronics. Um, the little one, little black one, going into my bass octave deluxe, going over to the vintage bass octave, both by MXR, going into um, my MXR carbon copy delay. And then some nights I was using an MXR um, mini bass wah. So I guess the entire pedal board minus the tuner is MXR because I, for these tours, I didn't want to bring a big pedal board. I, my limit, my size limit is actually like a cutting board, a kitchen cutting board. That's my, what my actual pedal board is. And then I just put the pedals on it and then it slips into my base case. So this is perfect. Cause if I buy a pedal board, I need a case or, you know, my suitcase or something, but this is great. It goes right into my base case. Um, and then on the, um, and then I am also playing, of course, the Kaza head with a Kaza 810. I have a Moog little fatty in front of me for key bass. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the touring rig. Um, and then on the record, I only used those pedals that I just named, um, plus the Tim LaFave the Three Leaf Audio Tim LaFave Octaver, I don't know how to say the Octave pedal. Um, and on the song Big Lee Strictus, I'm actually alternating between the Vintage Bass Octave and the Three Leaf Octave pedal between verse and chorus, but all of it with a pick. So that there's two different sounds, kind of similar sub-octave sounds, but slightly different just to differentiate the sections. And on Bling Bling, I'm playing just my 59P bass straight up um, and um, a Moog Prodigy bass. Yeah. And then throughout that record, I think I pretty much just used the 59P. I don't remember exactly, but I, th I think I basically just played that on the whole record. I didn't do a lot of effect stuff on that record. But, I mean, most of it is either key bass or, or another person in the band playing a key bass sound. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in and listening to this interview. And uh, I just want to thank all of the people who came out to see us this year in Germany. Um, over the course of this seven month tour, we had a blast and we're looking forward to coming back. <laughs>